I'm probably gonna sit down just because I have notes. Um, and just to let you know that I've been working on this project about women in interaction design history for two and a half years. I finished my manuscript in December. So I have not internalized everything yet. I don't have everything memorized. Um, but I wanted to bring some of uh, the stories to you guys today. Um, so I think it's important to talk about our history. And um, in looking back at our history, it helps us think about what we're going to do in the future. And next week is Women's History Month um, starts. So it's a perfect time to do this. So let me set some context first. Um, against the growing disillusionment of post-war 1950s perfect housewife era, we see in the 60s, um, we start to see second wave feminism and um, more and more women starting to move into the workforce. This started in the 60s and ran for about, uh, second wave feminism ran for about 20 years and women were concerned with equal equality, with pay, pay equality, financial independence, and bodily autonomy. And we see the first group of women starting to move into the workforce in large, large waves um, because they start to be allowed to be independent earners. Up until this point, they had part-time jobs. They weren't allowed to have their own bank accounts. They weren't allowed to have credit cards. And then the availability of birth control um, facilitated this because people could start to plan their families and they could delay marriage. And so that's important um, to set the background. So these are just a few dates of uh, things starting to change when many of the uh, Ivy Leaf schools started to allow women into their classes and into the degree programs, not in the sister schools. So this wasn't that long ago. Um, in contrast, Stanford actually allowed women, it was co-educational um, from the beginning and, and offered advanced degrees to women starting in 1891. So um, very progressive. <laughs> Pardon? Um, so despite these dissolving barriers, um, women were entering tech companies, they were joining the research labs, and they work, were working as consultants. And I've got a few of these little diagrams, which hopefully are um, readable, but some of the research facilities and research labs were like Bell Labs, IBM's Watson Lab, um, Xerox Park, Stanford Research Institute, and there were also consultants. And I'm gonna talk about one consultant first, Stephanie Rosenbaum. Um, Stephanie Rosenbaum began her career in technology as a consultant and she founded her company TechEd in 1967. Her interest and exposure in technology came when she participated in a summer program through the National Science Foundation and that specific program she was a part of was spearheaded by anthropologist Margaret Mead in 1959 and they brought together 50 juniors from high school working with the computer scientists and the big IBM 650 and teaching them for transit in the summer. And when I talked with her, she talked about how exciting it was and really interesting, but that programming was not gonna be for her. So that's one of the things she learned. But she realized that a lot of the people involved in these programs were going to start computer companies and they were terrible communicators. So um, she saw her sweet spot and what she ended up doing was studying language and philosophy of language at UC Berkeley and getting her master's and beginning to write technical publications and computer documentation and then doing usability and ease of use and ease of understanding on those documents. And that's how she got into the field and she is known as a foremother of usability. She founded her company in Michigan because that's where her husband was based. And so at this time, many, many people couldn't have their own you know, companies, they had to be, they had to go where their husbands went. Um, their, their needs were second. It, this actually turned out to be advantageous because she was in the heartland and could test with users that were not in Silicon Valley. She kept an office here in Silicon Valley to be near the companies, but her, the main, um, her main office with the usability labs are in Michigan. Um, over the years, she got closer and closer to actual software and less about the documentation. And by the time the web came about, they were act the company was designing software as well as testing. 
uh, she got involved in CHI early and with UPA and began writing articles and teaching ACI classes and workshops. Before there were a lot of programs, um, there were uh, a few, I think CMU existed. And she is still working now. 50 years later, she's still working. And last year, she got the UXPA Lifetime Achievement Award. And she's a hoot. Um, I, it, she's pretty funny. So 1974 is the first year a woman could get a credit card on their own without their husband or their father co-signing. It wasn't that long ago. Um, so now I'm going to talk about Park, Xerox Park. You may have heard of a few of these guys on this list, but there were also quite a lot of women. Um, who held PhDs and they worked, uh, were working there. Many came in as interns and postdocs to work, including Marilyn Tremaine and Lucy Suckman, which you may have heard of her, but I'm not going to talk about her today. So let's, I want to talk about first, um, actually, I'm going to talk about three women Adele Goldberg, Terry Roberts, and, and Doris Wells Papanak. And um, first, I'm going to talk about Adele Goldberg. And many people list her as a programmer and a computer scientist, and they would be totally right. But I am claiming her in the early era of interaction design um, because of much of the work that she did straddled UX and design research. She got her PhD in information sciences at University of Chicago while she was working um, as a research assistant here at Stanford. So there's a lot of people I'm going to talk about that have um, association with Stanford. And she got involved with a special interest group with the ACM around education and working with kids and teaching them programming and how to use computers. And Alan Kay from Park heard about her and recruited her to come work at Park with him in 1972. And um, they worked on the Dyna book together, which was one of his inventions, and on Small Talk, which he had created. And she was instrumental in designing the user research with kids to test on the Alto and the Star. And one of the things they were doing was teaching the students about object-oriented programming and how to use that to create other programs, and then testing that process and iterating. Um, she was part of the team that actually did the demo of Smalltalk to the Apple folks. And many of you may have heard that story that Steve Jobs and the Apple people came in, they saw it, they stole the ideas. That's actually not true. They didn't steal the ideas. They were, um, uh, Xerox was a, uh, a funder. They were one of the investors in Apple. And part of that trade was to get a demo of Smalltalk and the star system. And she was part of that and, and did not want to do it. She knew that those guys would totally understand how things work and would take it and run. And she, she you know, resisted, and the, the corporate folks in New York um, basically told her she had to do it. Um, so they ordered her to do it, and she was right. The, the firm, under, the Apple folks understood how things worked, and it heavily influenced the Macintosh. You know, they were already starting that work, but um, it, it changed a lot of things with of what, and of course, you know, the Mac, we all know Macs. Nobody really knows about the Xerox Star. Um, but one of the things that she also did was work on the Smalltalk 76, which led to the work on Smalltalk 80. And when Alan Kay left to go to Atari, she took over managing the team and was responsible for writing a series of books about Smalltalk 80, including the book on interface and user interface. And that was a collection of the components and how they work and how you would use them together, and um, defining that. And this documentation is one of the earliest documentation of user interface, uh, way before the human interface guidelines come out from Apple. Um, and Smalltalk was an object-oriented language. It influenced the gang of four who wrote the book Design Patterns, which influenced Jennifer Tidwell, who pulled together her set of interaction design patterns in designing interfaces, which then influenced the work that I did at Yahoo, and then a whole slew of interaction design pattern libraries around there. So this is sort of the early proto-foundation of that. But it also um, was the first overlapping Windows interface. It was one of the first object-oriented programming languages. It was the first application delivery system. Um, there were a lot of firsts with this that uh, hadn't been seen before, integrated multimedia, and video conferencing were all part of the system that she 
was um, driving, having worked on that with uh, Alan Kay. So 1978 is the first year a woman's job was protected if they became pregnant. Up until that point, if a woman got pregnant, she could be fired. And then the Pregnancy Discrimination Act was passed, which made uh, uh, discrimination by being pregnant part of the sexual discrimination laws. So the next person I wanna talk about is Terry Roberts. And she came to California um, to get her PhD. She was looking at Stanford. Um, and she wasn't sure where she also wanted to kind of do her research. So she looked at Park and she looked at Stanford Research Institute. And she ended up becoming interested in Park when after Stuart Card and Tom Moran from Carnegie Mellon created their HCI research lab, the research group at Park. And so she worked with them. She actually was the first PhD in HCI here at Stanford before that degree existed. Um, and she got that degree in like 78. She worked on her PhD 77 to 78. Still what? Still oh, it still doesn't exist? Okay, well, she got the first one. <laughs> For something that doesn't exist, there are quite a lot of people who have it. <laughs> um, so she also worked on the star. So you're gonna see the star a couple more times. Um, it was a work in progress when she started, so she ended up doing a lot of usability testing of components and um, on the parts and the pieces of interaction. And one of the, the things I found interesting when I spoke with her um, about that was she talked about how it actually didn't succeed and the reasons why. In addition to the hardware being super, super expensive, um, the STAR was a closed system. So everything happened within a document. The spreadsheets were inside the document, the image editing was inside a document, and that meant that other developers couldn't come in and build software to run on the, on the hardware, like unlike the Macintosh, which was an open system where outside people could create software. So, um, you know, in her mind, that was probably part of one of the, that was another reason why it failed. And she was there until 87 when she went to US West in Boulder. And US West was one of the baby bells in the 80s, um, the Bell, Corporation was broken up into a whole bunch of smaller Bell systems because of um, what's the uh, yes, thank you, anti-monopoly. And when she went to Bell, she actually was part of the standards group across the Baby Bells that developed uh, working on phone prompt systems, and they developed the semantic structure to reach X, press N, which I'm sure you've heard when you've gotten into a phone tree, and that became an adopted pattern for almost every phone tree system going forward. Um, so I found that pretty interesting that, you know, as an interaction designer and researcher, you were also, uh, we don't hear a lot about voice UX early on, um, that early. She also worked at a variety of other companies over her career, PeopleSoft, Intuit. She was the single designer and researcher on QuickBooks for accountants. Um, and then she finished out her career at Tableau working on um, data cleaning tools. And she, when I spoke with her, she just lit up talking about data and uh, working with data and creating tools for data. But she retired in 2019. And information about her is really hard to find. And one of the reasons why I started working on this project is because people are retiring and their work is disappearing. And if we don't write it down, nobody will know they even existed. Um, so we don't want that to happen. So 1980 was the year the Equal Oppor Employment Opportunity declared that sexual harassment on the job was a form of sexual discrimination. So I, th I thought that was interesting since that was not that long ago. Um, but even by the 1980s, there were still companies and universities where if a woman was offered a job and her husband worked there, she couldn't take it. They had to work in some place different. Um, so many women were locked out of places to work because of where their husbands worked. And I, I saw that story over and over in many of the interviews that I did. Yes? Yes, technically, but they're more than likely they probably would have asked the woman to leave just because of the way women were discriminated against. But yeah, women in, in, in these companies, married couples could not work in the same company. So it, it, he probably wouldn't have been offered a job. Or if it was a different job or a higher job, she probably would have been asked to leave. I don't know that for a fact though but good question. 
Um, so the next person I'd like to talk about just very quickly is Doris Wells Papanak. Um, she trained at Kansas City Art Institute with Victor Papanak. She studied with him. Her last name comes from marrying a distant cousin that she met way after she studied with him. So it was not like he, he introduced her to his son or something. <laughs> um, she started at Park in 83, the same year that Susan Kerr started at, at, Mac, at Apple, working on the icon and font designs um, at, on the Macintosh. She came to California and was working and researched and asking her network, where should she work? Where's the best place to work? And they said Park. So she actually ended up getting hired at Park. And she was the first formally trained designer working at Park. She was not a PhD. And she also worked on the star system. So at this point, everybody worked on the star system. <laughs> um, these are some, these are not the most sexy icons, but you know, we're talking 83. Uh, she primarily worked on icons with another designer named Norm Cox. And when she started, only the PhDs could touch the computers. So that makes it really hard to do your work if you can't actually do your work. Um, but she ended up proving herself by working with the development teams down in El Segundo, which was uh, a group that had been acquired by Park and all the developers were down there. And so she went down there and worked with them. And that success created trust up in up here in Palo Alto, um, where Park is, and she also brought in this sort of ethos of design into the group, where she would post things on the in the hallways and design in public, and people could see what she was doing, and that kind of changed the atmosphere. She left. Uh, did you? Then the question: Did you get this image from her? Because like the inbox is clearly hers. No, actually, this I got on Wikimedia. <laughs> I mean, I tried to find the, the other pictures of the star I got from Digibarn, which has a whole collection of really high quality Polaroids of computers with the star system on it. And I got permission uh, for that. But this is up on the, you know, on the internet. But yeah, it's totally hers because it says Wells. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and Doris in the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, she left Park in 89, went to Apple, and joined the developer side of Human Interface Group. And she also in, um, designed the first internet browser that was called CyberDog, which came out seven years before Safari. So, um, and I don't have a picture of that that I could find royalty free, but if you look up CyberDog, uh, web browser, uh, Apple, you'll see it. it. It was kind of like Netscape. It was all encompassing with mail as well as news and uh, web browsing. And then she left Park in 89. Um, or I said that already. Um, she, she left Apple in 87, 97, and moved to the Midwest and went back to school for education and has been using her uh, user-centered design skills to work on designing and developing new curriculum for K through 12 and then now up into um, higher education. So she uses her skills, but she doesn't do work in tech anymore. Um, and she was, she was an interesting person that I talked to. So speaking of Apple, so you guys may have heard of some of these guys, but there were a whole lot of women in the uh, human interface group and the advanced technology group. I'm kind of limiting my time limit uh, here from the 80s, early 80s to 92, when Steve Jobs came back and reorged everything and lots and lots of people left. So I'm gonna talk about three people here, Christina Hooper-Woolsey, which you guys may have heard of, Joy Mountford, and uh, Sue Booker, which you may not have heard of. So Christina Hooper-Woolsey is considered the mother of multimedia, which is way before the days of the web. So once upon a time, we experienced multimedia on CD-ROMs. And um, it was a hot, that's what I thought I was gonna do when I got out of grad school, do educational CD-ROM, multimedia, and by the time I got out and started working, the web came and it killed it. So that was a short-lived goal of mine. Um, so Woolsey did her postdoc work at MIT, and she spent 77 and 78 as a visiting professor um, in the architecture machine group working with Nicholas Negroponte. And she worked on the Aspen Movie Project, and you guys can look that up. Um, on the web. It was a collaborative team project that photographed the entire town of Aspen to create a multimedia experience of being able to navigate and fly through the town really like Google Earth today. So 
Today, it's not super impressive, but in 1978, it was pretty freaking amazing. It was, um, according to her, it was exhilarating, full of great people, ideas, and compelling projects. It was funded by the Cybernetics Technology Division of DARPA, so you know, government funded. We see a few screens from the LaserDisc. It was recorded to LaserDisc, and it is one of the first multimedia titles ever. Um, the screen grabs that I got are from a, a group called Domesday 86, and you can look that up. They have a video of the whole uh, video from the laser. They have a badly damaged copy of the laser disc, and they're trying to restore it. But it's pretty interesting to look at. And you know, there's some stills. There were different levels of this, and then here's a picture of a person sort of sitting in front of the the projection of the laser disc, and they could, you know, navigate left and right through the town, um, and it was this was groundbreaking at the time. So after MIT, she came back to California and was the research lab director at Atari, uh, working with Alan Kay and Brenda Laurel, until the company decided to shut down the research lab because it wasn't making money because it's a research lab. You know, they wanted more of their money going to making games. And so they shut the lab down and they walked everyone out. And that was in 1984. And she ended up going to Apple and she worked with the human interface group doing the first early definitions of UI elements like drop downs, how did windows work, how did navigation work. And this was right before uh, the, the Macintosh came out. And then in 1986, so at this point, Steve Jobs was pushed out, he's gone. So she founded a Skunk Works group with another woman named Sue Ann Ambron, who was an education expert. They founded the Multimedia Research Lab. So during this heyday, we have a whole lot of really interesting titles coming out of Apple. Um, and their goal was to explore multimedia, to explore animation, video, sound, along with text in the education space. And how could they bring media to help change how people were learning? And um, for pretty much every title that they delivered, she was the producer. And then a designer named Christy Rosendahl was the art director who had come over from the HyperCart team. And multimedia, uh, it, it, you know, they, they ended up exploring all kinds of things. And they also ended up partnering with companies like Lucasfilms and the Smithsonian and a lot of organizations that were making content. So they were working on, you know, how do we bring these things together in an interactive environment? Other people were providing the content. And they started out in black and white and eventually you know, moved to color, much more interactive as HyperCard got more robust. And then as QuickTime came out, the more video stuff. Um, so she was designated a distinguished scientist in 1985, probably one of the few women at the time. And after the multimedia lab was shut down in 92, when Jobs came back, she did continue at Apple until 97 and worked on a variety of projects. When she left Apple, she worked on um, this project called Visibility. Do you remember that? I have a couple copies. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, um, basically, it was a, a multimedia learning experience um, it was available commercially, and it was designed to train people how to see and how to draw. And it was co-created with the designers Gail Curtis and Scott Kim. And the whole design system, the visual design system, was developed by Meta Design. And um, it was full of videos and workbooks. And this was kind of at the peak of, and the starting, the beginning of the waning of multimedia when this came out. Because I remember when it came out, I was working on websites. And you know, as the multimedia heyday waned, um, Woolsey moved on to work with other projects and then eventually uh, at the Exploratorium and was uh, led the efforts to move the Exploratorium from the Palace of Fine Arts down to the Fisherman's Wharf. And she's done other educational ventures. And she recently self-published a book about her time in the running the multimedia research lab, so you can get it on Amazon, um, which I found really interesting and then I ended up uh, exchanging emails with her, getting a lot of more information. Um, so 1985, by this time, half of all college graduates were women. So we see this increase of women coming into higher education, 
where earlier they were going all the way up to getting PhDs, and by this time, um, we have you know still many going to get advanced degrees, but also we have this. Uh, uh, we start to see people with BFAs and MFAs starting to work in in some of these companies um, because we're starting to see some women as managers, and um, we see a, a, a larger group of relevant disciplines, we start to see graphic design being related and, and you know the different psychology, social psychology and cognitive psychology. And we have scholars from NYU and from MIT and from CMU coming to work in these different uh, organizations and labs for, you know, for their internships and their uh, uh, research projects. So the last, uh, not the last person, the second person that I want to talk about um, at Apple is Joy Mountford. And um, Joy Mountford was at Apple starting in 1986, but prior to that, she began her career after uh, grad school at Honeywell. And she was working on jet cockpits, space shuttle cockpits. Um, she got her degree in engineering psychology from the University of Illinois. And she was doing you know, interaction of screens and heads up display and VR stuff only when it was only available in military um, uh, situations. And she also uh, had to think about how did toilets work in space. So there was a lot of range of kinds of things that she was working on because of the work at Honeywell. And when I spoke with her, and she's told this story um, before, that when she interviewed at Apple, she came home and she cried because the screen was this big, okay? It was only in black and white. There was one keyboard and one mouse. And you know, if you look back, look at all the screens, look at all the different controls, 360 degrees, because what's up in space, right? And then this. But she obviously saw promise because she took the job. And, um, but I just think it's funny that she cried. <laughs> um, so she ended up managed, she came in to manage the human interface group. And, and Christina Woolsey told me that they, you know, told me about hiring her. And um, she, Mountford turned this group from a team that was documenting and evangelizing UI components into a visionary inventive powerhouse in and out of the company. So she had a vision that they were not just gonna be the people who documented how things worked for the, for the programmers. They were gonna do their own stuff. Um, so one of the most well-known inventions that came out of her team and so this is really, really tiny, because that's how tiny QuickTime was when it first launched, was QuickTime. Um, they, were, they were part of the team that developed and invented QuickTime, QuickTime VR, a whole host of QuickTime suites. And that was not the only one, the only thing, it's just sort of more one of the most well-known. A more recent invention that you can read about on Wikipedia is called Stacks, or it was called, called Piles when it first came out. That just came out like three years ago. It was invented back in the 80s by this group. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any pictures. Yeah. There's, there's all sorts of stories like that of things that the, the group invented. And um, so the group originally started by Bruce Tognazzini and then first versions of the human interface guidelines he led the efforts writing, but they were generally published internally. And when Joy came in, one of the things she wanted to do was get this out because people were starting to develop software for the Mac system. And if you publish those guidelines, then people will design to them and then you have an ecosystem of software, not just what Apple was creating, but what other people were creating. And so that helped raise and elevate the reputation of this organization. This other book, The Art of Human Computer Interface Design, was conceived by Joy, edited by Brenda Laurel, and they, it is full of essays written by all the members of, um, of the group. Many of them were Kai papers first that then um, are in, in the book, along with some invited authors, and it still holds up today. I think it was printed in 91 or something like that. I, I have a copy, and you read through it, and it's like, this could be today. It is still evergreen. So many of the concepts and ideas hold up. Um, so this partly helped create this landscape of respect and um, 
you know, ability for the group to be brought in as consultants when the company was working with outside vendors and outside uh, customers. They helped show developers how do you do design, how do you test to make sure that your designs and your interactions are clear and understandable, and um, how do you prototype. And so all the things they were doing within the organization using tools like HyperCard to build other tools and using video and telling and storytelling, they were also teaching um, to their customers and people that they worked with, which just spread that across Silicon Valley. After the reorg at Apple in 92, um, they changed the structure and she and several others went to Interval Research. Um, one of the other things that she worked on over time that she started at Apple was this uh, thing that she called the Expo where it was essentially a sponsored studio that Apple funded where she would go and partner with universities, but it wasn't just one university. She would generally have up to eight and have a design prompt for different groups of students to be working against. And then they would bring the winner out to Apple to present to the team and work with the, the Apple folks, which was pretty cool, and they got some money too. And so over the years, as she moved from various companies, um, working on ebooks and big data and autonomous vehicles, she was able to get all these other companies to sponsor the expo. And that lasted for 23 years. Um, unfortunately, the last two companies she's worked at did not, don't, they don't do work with students. So this, these pictures are from when Yahoo um, sponsored the expo back when I was there. So, um, and when she was there. And you can see in the black and white picture, that's Red Burns from NYU talking to Don Norman. Um, and it was crazy stuff. So like the middle one are these little babies and you know, lollipops that as you lick, the babies would move. And the faster you lick, the faster they moved. I mean, it was just totally <laughs> weird. It was really weird. But you know, it was experimental and exploratory and you know, who knows what would happen with that. <laughs> And I don't know, you know, if you have a group of people doing that, you don't want a second group of people coming up after them. <laughs> anyway, well. it was a little weird. But it was the, the expo in and of itself um, allowed Joy to work with thousands of students over these 23 years across the world and to mentor and, you know, sort of spread the word about good design. So the last person from Apple that I want to talk about is Sue Booker. And um, so Sue graduated in the mid 80s uh, from University of Michigan with a degree in industrial design. But she actually started her job, her first job as an interaction designer because she'd done her, rep, her resume on a Mac and had played around doing some Mac screens. Um, and so she ended up being an interaction designer for the bulk of her career. Uh, she was hired right out of school by, Mil by Bill Moggridge at ID2, before it was IDEO, and she was the first interaction designer hired into the firm. Um, she also was like the only one not from Stanford and, um, and, and the only one not British. So uh, there was a lot of firsts for her there. And um, she was the only female designer in the firm for a while. And one of their clients was Park. And so she got to spend a whole lot of time at Park and ended up working with Bill Verplank and collaborating with him. And then they poached him over into ID2. Um, but she got to work on things like interactive whiteboards and, and um, sort of crazy stuff that has never been, been um, invented. And she actually overlapped with Doris Wells Papanak because Doris mentioned that. And then um, one of their other clients was Apple. And in that process of working with Apple, she ended up getting posted away to mm -hmm. Apple. And she went to go work on this, the Newton. Mm -hmm. So this was the first tablet that came out of Apple. Didn't last very long. It wasn't super successful. But when she started, it was a Skunk Works project. She was the lead designer. And she was able to do all sorts of research. She followed people around, watched them. How did they exchange business cards? Because the concept was this was going to replace daytimers, was going to replace the the exchange of business cards. Um, and one of the other things she got to do was commission the, the ideas for the industrial design from companies around the US, as well as in Italy. She also got to go to Japan. And this is sort of an interesting story, is she went to Japan to talk with the folks making the touchscreen technology, or the screen technology, because this uses stylus. 
Um, but I think at the time they were thinking about touchscreen and they didn't know what to do with her when she arrived because they'd never had a woman come talking to the business people and needing to go into the clean room. So they had no place for her to change into that little bunny suit to go into the clean room. And she was telling me that she ended up being taken aside by the ladies who made tea and changing where they make the tea. So it was like not, you know, it's not sterile, um, but it was because they just didn't work with women. And, um, you know, she's got all sorts of uh, sketches. She kept all her sketchbooks from this time, but it was pretty petty time in terms of you know working on this thing that wasn't a real project yet, kind of being able to blue sky, go any direction. And she was telling me that the industrial designers inside Apple were actually pretty threatened by what was happening because they were not part of it. It was not a, a, a program yet. And there was another project happening in the advanced technology group around a tablet that um, was being done. And so Larry Tesler came over from that group to check out what was happening in the Newton thought what was going on was better, and so he killed the other project. Mm -hmm. And then this became a real project, which means they got a product manager, and now they had to you know, really think about the real industrial design. And by this time, if you uh, read the stories, the, I, the thing was huge. It was probably like the giant big iPads that we have today is what the form factor was gonna be, and it was gonna cost something like $10,000, which you know back then was kind of outrageous for a tablet. So. Um, John Scully came into their team and said, it's got to fit in my pocket. And so they ran around looking for foam core, cutting it down to fit in his pocket. And she told me like it was really a good thing he had a big pocket. Because the, the device, I don't, you know, is about, was about this big and it was about that thick. So it, yeah, it was a huge pocket. It was, it, it was, uh, it was not a small thing when it came out. And um, I had a friend when I was working um, at a startup who had one because he really liked the, the touch screen um, or the device. But a lot of the concepts and things that she designed, just like I talked about things that were happening in the human interface group that didn't show up until a couple years ago, like she developed and designed that paper crumple and the swoosh when you trash things that you see in the computer and iPad now. She designed that for the Newton in the 80s. And they're only now getting implemented. So all kinds of, so she has all sorts of patents around that kind of stuff. Um, she left Apple, worked all around the valley. I met her, I knew her at Yahoo, but she went back to Apple um, about a dozen years ago, spent the last dozen years of her career uh, becoming an expert in voice accessibility and working on Siri. And she was one of the only people in the company besides um, who specialized in that. and. Um, she spent the last part of her career on that. And she retired in 2021. So again, another person retiring. Um, so a discussion of graphical user interfaces and these um, uh, platforms and, and the companies creating the computers, can't, we can't not talk about Microsoft. Um, there's not as many women that I can find in Microsoft, but I am gonna talk about two. Uh, Virginia Howlett and Mary Dealey really hard to find information about these folks. Um, so Virginia Howlett joined Microsoft in 1985 as a graphic designer. She was working in marketing, working on print stuff. And she wrote Bill Gates a letter in 1987 describing the importance of why design and software was a competitive advantage. And I think it was because she was seeing how popular and, um, and how successful the Macintosh was, you know, having all those designers working on things. So that letter worked and she became a founding member and UI designer for the user interface architecture group at Microsoft. And uh, the team was her, Mary Dealey running usability research and Tandy Trower as the PM. Um, she worked on and launched Windows 3.0 of which the icons were designed by Susan Kerr because she had left Apple by then. And then she also worked, was the lead designer on Windows 95, which according to legend is, was the most heavily user tested product in Microsoft history. Um, and that aligns with the usability labs coming online. In another project that she worked on, um, she worked with type designer Matthew Carter and directed the project uh, for the new typefaces. You know, having come from graphic design, she saw like, we need better type for screen design. We need type that can be uh, scalable and that will look good small. So they ended up with Verdana, which is what's on the left. And it is partially named after her daughter, Anna. 
And then she continued working with him on the Sarah font, Georgia, which was specifically designed for screen use. And there are a couple other fonts, Tahoma, I think is another one, that, which is Verdana compressed and others that were part of the suite. And the suite was available on Microsoft Windows, but also on the Mac, it was released out. And then she left the company and retired, and she has spent the rest of her time as a painter and an educator. So she is not in tech, she is really hard to find, except you can find her paintings. Um, the last Microsoft person is Mary Dealey, and she received her PhD in rhetoric from Carnegie Mellon and did deep work in the usability of documents, just like uh, Stephanie Rosenbaum did. That's how she started. And Ginny Reddish, who I'm not talking about today, also started her career doing usability testing of documentation um, and then realizing that easy to read documentation isn't gonna help hard to use software. Um, so she started at Apple in the early 80s helping user test the Lisa, and that was while she was in grad school working with another woman named Ellen Nold. And um, she was at Adobe prior to Microsoft and I don't know exactly how long. Um, she came in to Microsoft around the time of the Windows 3 release and then joined to become the lead usability person for the user interface architecture group. And she founded the first two usability labs at Microsoft um, and designed them and led them the construction of those. And she was instrumental in getting usability testing into the software development cycle at Microsoft. She authored a ton of papers. There's a lot of Kai papers um, about, about this. There are also lots of papers that cite her work um, on how to set up labs, how to integrate testing into the product development process. We take that for granted nowadays, but back then that was just not done. And you know, nobody had labs. And, and um, so she was essentially the leading expert on integrating usability practices into these product processes. And um, she left Microsoft after that Windows 95 push and worked with companies like Netscape and Cisco and HP. And unfortunately, um, she died in 2002. So uh, her career was not super long. So I can't, um, so one of the things I want to acknowledge is sort of an elephant in the room is that if you've noticed, all the people I've talked about so far are white. And part of that comes from the fact that at this point, we're expecting women to have PhDs. And the number of uh, women graduating with PhDs during this time was very low compared to men. And um, the number of people of color graduating with PhDs at this time was even lower. Yes? So, I mean, a lot of the people you talked about are designers and can design master's degrees, a terminal degree, so. Well, only one have... was, uh, only a couple were uh, masters. But even other people who I haven't talked about um, had PhDs and just there weren't, because um, they weren't being hired at the master's level. They were being hired at the PhD level uh, in these early, early days on the West Coast. Um, but on the East Coast, thing, there were things happening with larger companies that were adding tech um, that had a longer history of hiring diverse workforces. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, three people quickly. Um, Carol Bilson, Sylvia Harris, and Valerie Fenster. And this work most was all being done on the East Coast. Um, so Carol Bilson, um, she has a, a undergraduate degree in industrial engineering from University of Michigan, trained as an industrial designer and graphic designer. And she started at Kodak in 1980. She was the first African-American designer in the company. She founded support groups and networking groups for African-American employees and black women at the company. And um, she moved from design to product management, eventually becoming a general manager. That's your path. Um, <laughs> And she ended up running several programs, but the most successful was the Picture Maker um, division, which brought in over $80 million into the company through the time that she ran that program. And just, uh, I worked on that when I, I worked at Kodak right after grad school, and I worked on stuff. You know, you could go in, bring in a picture, lay it down, get enlargements, get repeats, mm -hmm. put in your, you know, eventually with digital cameras, put in your flashcards, get uh, pictures. These were all over you know, drugstores and Target and Walmart and stuff. So it was very, very su successful. She left Kodak after 20 years, went to head up UED at Pitney Bowes, and then was promoted to VP of Global Design and Usability, which made her the first African-American to head up a business division in corporate US at the time. 
And then in 2014, she became president of the Design Management Institute, which um, is a think tank and research institute, primarily working with Fortune 500s. But one of the interesting things that is during her time there, they released the results of, the, of a design value index that they had been tracking. So they brought in researchers, and, the, and this started before she went in there, before she started, but they looked at Fortune 500 companies with C-level design people and tracked them from 2005 to 2015 against the S&P 500. So they had a list of about 10 or 15 companies. And over those 10 years, those companies outperformed the S&P 500 by 211%. It's pretty interesting. You know? So that's the design value index. It's not being tracked anymore. They stopped it in 2015. So the last two people I want to talk about are Sylvia Harris and Valerie Fenster. And um, so in 1983, the Minitel, which I don't know if you guys, you've heard of it. So the Minitel was this dumb terminal that was given to every household in France. And it was um, intended to replace the yellow pages in phone books. And it wiped out yellow pages and yellow page advertising in France. And at the time, Valerie Fenster was working at Ketchum Advertising in Chicago and was handling the clients and their yellow page advertising accounts. And she was charged to become an expert in e-commerce and tools like the Minitel to understand how they worked and how advertisers could become part of that directory and explosion, you know, and, and exploring how that could be used here in the US. So she got her start kind of learning about e-commerce. In the mid 80s, um, so she was working with Sylvia Harris, and Sylvia Harris, let's go back, is on the left, and Valerie Finster is on the right. Left, right. Just, I had to double check there for a second. Um, Harris was working with her doing some print work, and she was a partner in a consulting firm called 212 Associates that she and two of her classmates from Yale School of Design had uh, founded. And Sylvia Harris's early career, she was working on things like video techs and UI for Prodigy, and um, one of their clients was Citibank, and they had this opening for someone to come in and lead interaction design and usability testing, and she told Valerie Finster about it, Valerie got the job, and so she became Sylvia's client. So they collaborated together for several years on designing UI for the ATMs, and this was when the ATMs were switching over from ASCII text to touchscreen. And this is a picture of their ghost uh, branch. So this is the usability lab that, is in, that was in a building in Manhattan in the basement where they could set it up and rearrange and do other things and bring in people to test their, their prototypes. Um, so during this time, uh, Fenster would do the interaction design and do set up all the testing and uh, uh, Sylvia worked on the wireframes and all the UI. And um, this is an early, early mock-up of uh, one of the screens. It's really like low, low, <laughs> this is so old school, it's just too funny. Um, but they worked together for a long time on um, all, all sorts of banking products, different tools, checking, savings accounts, uh, depositing checks, all these things that we think are really sort of passe today. That wasn't being done. People were scared to put a check in. They were scared to move money. Um, you know, they really just wanted to check their balance and get some cash. Um, so they worked together. They would build these prototypes, put them, um, they had some developers that worked with them to put them on the actual ATM machines. And they worked that way for a while until trying to get ready for some testing late at night, as you do. Um, things overheated and kind of exploded and next thing you know, she's, so I, I talked with Valerie and she was like, no, then I switched to building things in HyperCard and faking it on the Macintosh because uh, the, the ATM machines were so fickle to build prototypes on, it was kind of silly. Um, one of the interesting things is in uh, 1990, the American Disabilities Act passed and Citi took the lead on developing an ADA compliant ATM. And there's two screens here, there's, there's the deposit touchscreen and the, uh, the, the main touchscreen and the deposit withdraw touchscreen. And so they prototyped all different kinds of things and then they brought in um, blind and low sight folks, uh, 
one of the designers that worked at 212, he's actually here in the Bay Area, and I talked with him. He said, you know, people are coming in where they're seeing eye dogs, and, and they learned a lot. They learned that white on black was better for low sight than black on white because of the shimmer and um, the visual issues that happen with the vibration of, of, a black, of the white background. And uh, so this particular uh, ATM launched. It no longer exists. It was written up um, by ID Magazine in 1993. That magazine no longer exists. Uh, so, and it also uh, was part of a Kai panel in 94. Yes? Does the white on black and white still exist today with today's current computers because they're slightly different, or is it the same? I actually don't know. I mean, I think there's probably because the white is backlit, and it does cause uh, a visual vibration. It probably still has the same issues. I don't know that for a fact. We'd have to do probably some biological scientific research on that. I know I get ocular migraines when I spend too much time looking at white screens versus the darker screens. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. But that's a good question. And um, so after this project, Sylvia kind of left her firm and was exploring her work as an African-American designer. She was writing essays about being an African-American designer and what that meant. Um, and after this point, uh, then she got involved with the 2000 census. And every, all of her work after that was around civic and policy design. And uh, she died in 2011, unfortunately. Um, but she brought user-centered design practices into print design. And she was one of the first people to do that. And Valerie Finster went on to get uh, a master's degree in human factors, um, ended up doing some work with Bank of America on AOL, and is now doing healthcare devices. And she was telling me it's so much harder to design work that has to go through FDA than work that, you know, financial work. Um, but she's still working. And finally, 1993 is the year that maternity leave is finally protected. Up until this point, if you got pregnant, you couldn't get fired. But if you left to go on maternity leave, there was no guarantee your job would be there when you got back. So with this law passing and the emergence of the World Wide Web as a communications vehicle and a viable design opportunity, we have a sea change shift. And, and we see the emergence of third wave feminism. We see the highest numbers of women graduating from college. And we see a growing number of women entering technology, including interaction design, because of the opportunities afforded by web design and web. It was so easy. And we see people coming from all disciplines into this space. And it changed everything. But that's another story. Mm -hmm. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Oh, Mike's. Yeah. And thanks for the questions in, in line. I really appreciate that. Um, so you alluded to this throughout the talk about like the difficulty of tracking down this information, but I was wondering if you could talk a little more about like what you had to do to find these people. Like it sounds like some of it you you knew through connections, but like places so where it was different. I started with my connections just because I'm old and I've been working for a long time. And I figured if I know people, I might as well start with them. Um, Many of the people I started with, though, were sort of starting with the 90s and with the web. And then I kind of asked people who else I should be talking to. I also did lots of research. Um, I read and I trolled the citation lists, uh, bibliographies and citations in a ton of books of, of Silicon Valley tech history, you know, around Xerox Park, around Apple, you know, about the tech, not necessarily just looking for names of women who might have been working at the company that I then could look up. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Wayback Machine looking at, and so much from the mid-web days are, is gone, because Flash, you know, people building things in Flash, it doesn't exist. And then people led me to people. So I, I interviewed a couple of the women who, helped, who started, uh, founded Kai. I um, interviewed. Uh, people who were doing things in the mid '90s and doing conferences and and um, you know so it's like and I also put out on social media and said if you were going to read a book about women in interaction design history, who should be on there? And I have a list of turns out hundreds and hundreds of women, many who've never heard of, um, and I just ended up 
kind of selecting based on, you know, can I find their information? Can I find them? I interviewed 45 people um, in person and, you know, on Zoom, and they led me to other people. But like Terry Roberts, I basically interviewed her in November, and I had to finish my manuscript in December, by December 1st. Like, I didn't find her, and it turns out we have people in common that we know. But I just didn't realize, I think I'd read something and I wasn't sure she was female because everything was Terry, and Terry could go either way. And it wasn't until there was a mention of her, oh, I, I found Doris uh, Wells Papanock, and then she mentioned Terry, and I'm like, wait a minute. And so then I looked her up on LinkedIn, and I'm like, oh, we have these people in common. So I reached out to those people and said, could you please introduce me to her? And it took a while to get her because she was on vacation because she's retired, you know, she doesn't, doesn't care about any of this. Um, and then I was able to interview her. And um, so it, I started working on this two and a half years ago um, because I was teaching a history class, same time Christina was teaching, and we were trading names. Um, and then I just kind of, it just kind of ballooned. And there's so many people that need their stories told. You know, even if it's just you know, sort of feels mundane today, but at the time they were, you know, they were the first. And it's not always good to be the first, but somebody has to be first. Um, and you know, so like with Joy Mountford, one of the things with her, she hired lots and lots of people not like her. She hired writers, she hired artists, she hired uh, designers. You know, she comes from engineering psychology, and she always made sure there was at least one woman on every team. And so it takes someone proactive like that to bring more people into the fold. Um, and it has to be concerted and thoughtful. Um, but yeah, I have lists and lists. And then when I got, I got feedback on my original proposal and sample chapters, I was given a list of a whole bunch of other people from academia. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do that too. <laughs> I have to have boundaries. But there are so many people working on so many really interesting, amazing projects right now. It's, and in the past, um, in the academic spaces. I mean, that's just like a whole other library of encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that answered your question. I'm curious, um, you, you titled the talk The Lost Women of IXD. I'm curious mm -hmm. if you flip that bit, the non-lost, like the ones who you think get visible. Do you think they're all lost? Do you think there are like some who oh. you intentionally didn't include? I'd be curious, like who are some of the role models for you who are kind of so I didn't include Brenda Laurel, mm -hmm. who's probably one of the most well-known or written about people because she has been written about so much, um, both as a game designer and an interaction designer. Um, I talk about her in the book. You can't not talk about her, mm -hmm. but I don't profile her because there's the whole book's written about her. Um, I barely talk about Susan Kerr because there's lots and lots and stuff, but uh, you got to talk a little bit about UI design. and. Um, who else do I not talk about? I ended up, so I, in, in, in the stuff that I wrote, I wrote way too much. Um, I had to cut 35 people from my manuscript. Um, and one of the people I cut, some of the decisions were, how well known is this person? So like Karen Hansen, who is one of the, was one of, uh, uh, she's a design leader at the global X, you know, CX level. Um, and she's very well known, and there's been a lot written about her because of her work at Intuit mm -hmm. and, and working with Brad Smith and infusing design for delight through the company. So I kept some quotes from her, but I ended up cutting her because there's a lot. You can just put in her name and you get you know pages of stuff about her. Uh, but I started with her because I know her. So, um, But she gave me names of other people to talk to. Um, who else did I not? I. I yeah, I, I don't go as far back, like I, yeah, no, I think that's prim primarily Brenda Laurel. Brenda Laurel's probably the most well-known person that I don't talk about. I ended up cutting like Terry Irwin and um, some systems folks and, um, yeah. Thank you. So, um, do you have any theories from your conversation with all these women about why so many women have gotten lost in these conversations, people who are probably shoulder to shoulder with a, a Don Norman or equally well-known people? I have theories and I, um, one, we, we, the big we, women, you know, not all women, but women, we are not as good at self-promotion because we're team players. 
interaction design is a team sport. And I think that's, you know, who wants to take credit for something when it was all of you that worked on it? Uh, but many guys do. And, and, you know, not to fault them, but they're much better at promoting themselves and their work than women are. Just, I mean, that's a generalization. But I think that's part of it is because we're not out there talking about all the great stuff we did. And uh, we're not writing about it. We're not uh, showing it off as much as the men because we believe in that collaboration and it's the, it takes that village. So I think that's a big reason why. Um, and then a lot of these women, yes, they were like really focused on their work, um, but they're retired now. And they, you know, and they were pre-web pre-blogging, pre-sharing on social media. And so they just didn't have the venues other than a Kai paper here or there to get even information about their work out. And so I think that's another reason why a lot of those earlier people are, we just don't hear their names very much because they're, the, the opportunities and the, and the channels for broadcasting about themselves didn't exist. Well, I think if there aren't any more questions, then um, people should go eat. Thank you very much. Can we have one more thank you to Aaron?